Robert Alter, best-selling translator of the Hebrew Bible, a phrase that in all the world applies only to him, opens his small and enjoyable book, The Art of Bible Translation, with an important admission. The practice of translation, as I have learned from experience, entails an endless series of compromises. Some of them happy, some painful, and not quite right because the translator has been unable to find an adequate English equivalent for what is happening, often brilliantly, in the original language. Alter mentions this theme, this idea about the necessity of compromise throughout the book. Here he is again. All translations are imperfect things. As a translator, you find yourself constantly weighing sound against meaning, fidelity to the original against idiomatic aptness in the target language, and you are often not entirely sure that you have made the right decision. And again, he says, many choices in translation end up being only partially satisfactory solutions. This is true wisdom for the church. It defers graciously to others, and it defers to the world as God has made it. It is impossible to bring every last bit of meaning from one language into another. This wisdom has Puritan backing of all things. As John Owen himself said, no translation is able in all things universally to exhibit that fullness of sense and secret virtue which is in many passages of scripture in its original languages. Unfortunately, however, Robert Alter's commendable even-handedness quickly gives way to another spirit in his book. An even more powerful theme in that book is that nearly all English translators of the Hebrew Bible lack Alter's skill in noticing and then rendering the beautiful and subtle literary devices present therein. Because Alter values literary art, his compromises in favor of it are always superior to those made by other translators. Now, this reviewer of this book is not sure how it could be any other way. You will find literary art only if you love it so much that you train your ear to hear it. Perhaps someone with Alter's prodigious gifts inevitably will magnify his office. But Alter protests too much, he says. The reflections in this book are offered in a spirit of humility, not triumphalism. And yet his claim of humility rings a bit hollow given that he follows it immediately with these words. I have tried to do in my English version of the Bible what other translators by and large have not seen the need to do because they have had at best only a patchy sense of the literary aspects of the Hebrew. Alter is generally favorable toward the King James Version, but he says that modern translators, aside from him, quote, ride roughshod over the Hebrew syntax and are obtuse about the word choices of the Hebrew writers. They are also, quote, blind to narrative context and even, quote, out of touch with the literary culture of our own times. How does one say humbly that most other translators are aesthetically ham-handed not only in Hebrew but in their native language of English? Though Alter's book was certainly enjoyable, readers may be excused for wondering if Alter has, at times, only a patchy sense of humility. This is, if you hadn't noticed it yet, a review of Alter's book on translation. And any review that does not immediately follow these criticisms with sincere appreciation of Alter's brilliance is itself triumphalist and lacking in humility. Alter's lifelong dedication to those beautiful, blocky Hebrew letters is truly staggering. Alter is clearly sincere in saying, from the beginning, my translation was impelled by a deep conviction that the literary style of the Bible and both the prose narratives and the poetry is not some sort of aesthetic embellishment of the message of scripture, but the vital medium through which the biblical vision of God, human nature, history, politics, society, and moral value is conveyed. But ultimately, it is because Alter does not view the Old Testament as divinely inspired, as best I can tell, that he fails to convince this reader, that his compromises are the best compromises, that when he encounters a knotty bit of poetry, the way he untangles that knot is always best. His is an artistic and scholarly dedication. It is religious at best, as best I can tell, only vestigially. I believe Alter is ethnically but not religiously Jewish. God, in his word, speaks to Athens and Nineveh, not just Jerusalem and Geneva. But when one must weigh literary art versus the needs of the church, Alter will never value the latter. Surely it takes belief to know how to make the compromises that best serve the believing community. Permit an example from the first chapter of Genesis. 
Alter is particularly proud of the way he rendered the famous Hebrew phrase tohu vabohu, the phrase the King James famously renders without form and void. Alter says, I could not think of an English pair of phonetically echoing words that accurately conveyed the meaning of the Hebrew, and so I substituted alliteration for rhyme in the word pair using welter and waste. But what does welter mean? The word is rather uncommon. A check of the dictionary suggests that it is used almost exclusively in the phrase welter of some confused mass of something, as in a welter of reports have come in about the tornado. Maybe this common use is sufficient for English speakers to divine the meaning of the earth then was welter and waste, as Robert Alter's translation of the Hebrew Bible has it, and maybe not. Formless and empty, the choice of several modern translations, does definitely miss a literary opportunity. The two words do not rhyme, formless, empty. They don't have any other aesthetic or literary connection. And to make things more complicated, it is possible that bohu in the Hebrew is a nonce word, a made-up nonsense word, like "'Twas brillig and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the way." So a meaningless alliterative gloss might possibly be doubly accurate, picking up the fact that one word is kind of really not a word and that both words are related in some kind of literary way, in this case through sound. But formless and empty do have the advantage of being immediately understandable by nearly all English-speaking churchgoers. Surely that is a value to which the church ought to hold. Another example, Alter finds in Isaiah 123 some English rhyming and alliteration possibilities that echo literary features of the Hebrew. But he ends up having to use an archaic and even somewhat silly word to do it. Your nobles are knaves and companions of thieves. Knaves is clever but distracting. The Hebrew word presumably did not sound antiquated to its original hearers like it came from the Middle Ages. Alter has compromised in favor of reflecting literary devices in the Hebrew. Most other translators compromise in the opposite direction. Every translator here, and in many other places in scripture, must lose something of value in order to gain another thing of value. What should the church, the believing community of those who listen to the voice of God in scripture, what should it value more? Should it compromise readability for the sake of aesthetic accuracy or vice versa? How should it weigh these values? Paul's principle in 1 Corinthians 14 gives an answer. Edification requires intelligibility. If with your tongue you utter speech that is not intelligible, how will anyone know what is said? As Augustine said long ago, and I put this quote in the beginning of Authorized, what is the use of correct speech if it does not meet with the listener's understanding? There is no point in speaking at all if our words are not understood by the people to whose understanding our words are directed. The teacher then will avoid all words that do not communicate. If, in their place, he can use other words which are intelligible in their correct forms, he will choose to do that. What use, Augustine says, is a golden key if it cannot unlock what we want to be unlocked? And what is wrong with a wooden one if it can, since our sole aim is to open closed doors? He's talking about the closed doors of understanding. But Alter differs with Augustine. Alter writes, some evocation in English of the strong rhythms of the Hebrew is indispensable in order to convey an adequate sense of what is compelling about biblical literature. What is compelling about biblical literature? Is it the literary devices or is it the content? The two, of course, cannot be fully separated. Alter is perfectly right about this. But in translation, they are necessarily teased apart and put back together with some losses in the process. God gave us a world in which these losses are necessary. Augustine was willing to lose literary beauty in order to achieve the higher value, Paul's value, of intelligibility. Alter reveals here and throughout his book that his priorities are different. Now, in my heart lies genuine sympathy for the opinion of Paul Mankowski, who reviewed Alter's translation of the Old Testament for First Things back in August of 2019, and saw in it a, quote, revindication of formal equivalence in Bible translation. Alter, he said, rescued vast tracts of English biblical narrative not from obscurity, but from specious and arbitrary lucidity. Alter inveighs against the soft bigotry of low expectations implicit in functional translations like the NIV, who seem to be, in the words of Mankowski again, 
impelled by the misconception that everything in the biblical text needs to be explained. And Mankowski is surely right that the impulse to explain through translation can end up making the Bible conform to modern views or modern ideologies. This can happen, though whether it does happen in evangelical Bible translations is a matter of some dispute. Alter insists, for his part, quote, the Bible itself does not generally exhibit the clarity to which its modern translators aspire. The Hebrew writers reveled in the proliferation of meanings, the cultivation of ambiguities, the playing of one sense of a term against another. And this richness is erased in the deceptive, antiseptic clarity of the modern versions. What a great phrase in itself. And I know a pretty significant ex-King James only leader, that is someone who used to be a leader in the King James only world, who, shall I say, helped produce one of the books that has promoted King James onlyism in King James only circles for a long time, who left his King James onlyism after he studied Hebrew, after he'd been in the ministry for a while. He told me on the phone, we had a long conversation, that once he saw how elliptical, that was the word he used, the Hebrew is, how often it is suggestive, difficult to translate, how often interpretation is required to even put it in any kind of meaningful English. Once he saw that, he realized that one of the major planks of the King James onlyism he had inherited, namely that the King James is a perfect word-for-word -word formal literal translation of the Hebrew and Greek, just could not be sustained. He would have been helped by Alter's discussion of the difficulty and the compromises required when translating Biblical Hebrew. But I would suggest, after many years of wrestling personally through the respective values of readability and accuracy, that this is a false choice. Unless there are portions of the Bible that simply cannot be understood and God designed them that way, the one entails the other. Readability means nothing without accuracy because it raises the question, what is one reading? An inaccurate but readable Bible is not the Bible at the places where it is inaccurate. Likewise, accuracy entails readability. A technically accurate translation that fails to get God's message across is not a translation at all, if it's not readable by the intended audience. It's like the wisdom my pastoral mentor once offered to me when I asked about balancing ministry and family. Do the best you can by God's grace in both. A translator worth his or her halos, that's Greek for salt, will never fully let go of either. Despite my Christian skepticism about Alter's rhetorical overreach, deaf as it is to the concerns of Christ's church, Alter has done what most considered impossible. He has found a new spot, though only for the Old Testament, on the formal to functional Bible translation continuum. He has added something of a second vertical dimension to the well-known horizontal line. Contemporary translators of the Bible should plunder the Jews by poring over Alter and gleaning from his wisdom. Perhaps there are places where he has found elegant compromises that satisfy the accuracy and readability needs of the church. But John Owen, because he sees the Bible as divine, offers wisdom that could help alter. Though some translations may and do render the words of the original more properly and better represent and insinuate the native genius, beauty, life, and power of the sacred style than some others do, yet none of them can or do express the whole excellency, elegancy, and marvelous efficacy of it. Neither is this any reflection upon the translators, their abilities, diligence, or faithfulness, but that which the nature of the thing itself produceth. There is, in the sacred scripture, in the words wherein by the Holy Ghost it was given out, a proper, peculiar virtue and secret efficacy, inflaming the minds of the readers and hearers, which no diligence or wisdom of man can fully and absolutely transfer into and impress upon any other language. I recommend Robert Alter's book on Bible translation. I did enjoy it. It contained a lot of wisdom from a brilliant man. I recommend and I use his Old Testament translation in three volumes. I went ahead and bought it even though it was somewhat expensive and I have checked those notes especially. But I put more accent on what Alter says about the necessity of compromise than I do on his particular solutions to those compromises. I regard those solutions as sort of like a concept car from which future designers of Bible translations can at times borrow good ideas. And I just will not give in to the idea that there is one best Bible translation or one best kind of Bible translation, in this case, the kind that honors literary art. God gave us a situation in which 
we do just need to muddle through, doing the best we can to preserve as much meaning as possible. And given that compromise is required in all translation, it's actually great that we have some translations that compromise in favor of literary art and others that compromise in favor of bringing across lucid meaning. As I often say, we have an embarrassment of riches in English Bible translation, and we are debtors to Robert Alter for adding something valuable to that already large stack of riches.